Hi, I'm Rob Penzak. And I'm Rick Wingrove. Welcome to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. Uh, today we're joined by Rob Boston. He's the Director of Communications for Americans United for Separation of Church and State. He's also the editor of Church and State Magazine and the author of several books. Uh, one of these, Why the Religious Right Has It Wrong, about separation of church and state. We talked about roughly a year ago, and this is a spectacular primer that puts everything into one place. Today we're going to be talking about taking liberties, why religious freedom doesn't give you the right to tell other people what to do, and there really couldn't be a more appropriate time than right now given kind of all the legislation that's flying around. So Rob, thank you for joining us. Yeah, we, uh, we'll get into that book more uh, later in the show after announcements and news, but I bought that book on Kindle and actually read the whole book. Good for you. So. <laughs> That is great. And we'll, we'll spend you know, most of the show talking about that. Uh, some announcements to start off. If you can go to the Fairfax Public Access website, their contest is running for seven more days where you get to vote for the best show. Uh, God created the entire universe in seven days, so I imagine that you can get on there and pick your favorite shows. Uh, we'd you know, love to top that. You know, this is our first year, obviously, that we've completed, and we're in the running for the best show, so please do that. Um, we also are always looking for any checks. If you consider this a valuable show and you think it helps you understand more about religion, science, skepticism, uh, that's where you can send it. Take a look down there, and we will put that to good use. Rick, you had some announcement about one of our co-hosts, Jamila Bay. Jamila Bay has a new uh, position as the communications director for Secular Student Alliance. Right, so. so congratulations to her. All right. On that. Okay. Um, a couple of other announcements. One is that atheists, we are always looking to challenge you. If you believe in Bigfoot or some of the conspiracy theories about 9-11, we want you to apply the same skepticism you do to religion to all the other aspects of life. So please call in and, you know, correct us if we're wrong about something or maybe we'll help you see a more skeptical version of it. And finally, we want to talk about Cosmos. How, how is Cosmos being accepted by the religious right? Apparently getting a little bit of pushback um, mm -hmm. from various people, not surprisingly, but you know, having watched it, you know, recommend it, he uh, does deal with uh, creationism in a pretty direct way and essentially just blows it out of the water from uh, uh, you know, episode one. Right. Uh, and of course, there's some other news we're going to talk about here in a minute about yeah. the recent findings about the uh, cosmic background radiation. Right, we have some great findings. Which that. also have some implications for uh, Genesis beliefs. I do. And one of the big complaints, I guess, on the religious right is that they're not getting equal time that Neil deGrasse Tyson is getting to just run on and on about all of this, you know, sciencey stuff, and they want the equal time. So it's a little bit amusing given that this uh, Christian majority has all sorts of platforms to get anything that they weren't heard, regardless of you know, the lack of scientific backing. Right. But if you guys need one more avenue to voice your complaints, please call into Road to Reason. We're happy to listen to the creationist view of things and maybe set you straight on those. Yeah, just for perspective, we are on the religion uh, channel at this uh, station, and we are the only non-religious Station, uh, show on this channel, so right, we don't have our seven hundred. They're not getting equal time apparently. Or if you turn on the uh, TV any Saturday or Sunday morning, you're going to see about thirty different channels with uh, religion on them. And um, you know, I, I do turn those every, on every once in a while, see what's going on. But they're getting more than their fair share of uh, representation in the media. I yeah. have to say. Now, talk of representation. I understand that there's one more representative up in heaven today. Yes, there is. The big news of the week, Fred Phelps is dead. Now, I shouldn't make light of this because a man is dead, but uh, we all know who he is. We all know what he's done, and he got sick rather, uh, it kind of snuck up on me. I didn't know he was having trouble. And as soon as I heard of it, three days later, the man's dead. Now, um, of course, that begs the question, where is he now? Heaven or hell? And um, depending on who you talk to, you know, uh, some say he had been excommunicated or unordained or something at his church. I don't know. Maybe. Right, I think one of his sons said that he had been excommunicated. excommunicated his, his, his because crime, he decided to be nice or something. Right, he's trying to be slightly more inclusive than the God hates fags and you should all burn right. in hell. Uh, so he was but booted I'm a, out. I'm a believer that, uh, and I use that word advisedly, believer that um, being just really an insufferable person and causing all the heartache and uh, discord and bigotry that he brought is not the key to heaven. So, yeah. you know, I went to a humanist meeting in Richmond a few weeks ago, and the topic came up about humanists really just trying to be inclusive and accepting and hope for everybody. And you know, I raised the point that you know, I'm not, I'm not praying that you know, in the humanist sense, that Hitler or George Bush, for that matter, or Dick Cheney, who shot a guy in the face and you know, hid behind executive privilege for the vice president. I think some people do so much harm 
that I'm not really rooting for them to get over the disease mm -hmm. or to get better. I think the world is a lot better off without yeah. some of these people that just propagate this really foul, divisive, nasty yeah. stuff out there. So, so I, know, I know how I vote on where he's ending up. Long story short is uh, my opinion, if hell does exist, he's there now. So just right. an opinion. So, right. Rob, any thoughts on that? Only to say that um, if he's in heaven, I don't want to go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've seen that too. <laughs> All right. Um, ne next bit we want to, oh, you got another one. Oh, just on one other thing. Uh, American Atheist Convention is coming up in Salt Lake City, of all places. That'll be April 17th through 21. Still time to get tickets. Get over there, because it'll be fun. All right. Um, next thing we talk about is the discovery and cosmology with the Big Bang. Um, if for anybody that saw the show a couple weeks ago, you know that astrophysicists can be very ornery and crotchety. Dave and I had to actually go out on our spaceship to drag Lawrence Krauss into the studio. Yeah. Um, now, it turns out that these guys, these cosmologists, weren't content with being able to see 13 and a half billion years back into the past. Um, you know, it used to be that at that time, the universe had, was so hot, you know, it was 3,000 Kelvin, that the, it was in a plasma state. And at that point, the photons of light couldn't get past. It was essentially a wall, so we could only see back to 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Right. Yeah, um, so for 380,000 years, uh, that's as close as we could get previously. Now we're back to, as I heard it put, within a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second of the, uh, the Big Bang. Right, so, right. so it's really, you know, it's that, phenomenal. Uh, that, that's the gap that God that, has left God's to hide gap. in there. That's the gap left for God. Um, so, no, but it really, it's really a testament to kind of what science can do. Um, this is the first direct evidence supporting inflation theory, which really tied in the original Big Bang to the universe that we observe today. Um, and you know, ties in a lot of Einstein's theories. We're going to actually try to have uh, somebody on next week, if Rick and Larry can get them, right. that understands this stuff really well. And you can really see how a scientific model has incredible predictive value. Yeah. And then compare that to, you'll see on uh, Answers in Genesis, apparently, that when God spoke of an outstretched hand, he was speaking of inflationary theory in retrospect. And we can compare those uh, religious models to yeah, the so, science. So we'll, we'll talk about this uh, a little bit more next week. Uh, not sure who we're going to have on, but we'll find somebody. Uh, hopefully a physicist. <laughs> that would be great. Get them in here and talk about this and then probably do some compare and contrast with the uh, Genesis creation fable. Right. So Now moving on, you were at CPAC. You want to tell us what CPAC. happened there? CPAC, yeah. CPAC was fun. What uh, we do at um, Beltway Atheists and Nova Atheists is we table these events. We've tabled Values Voters events for years now and this year we went to CPAC. And uh, we basically just set up outside, and uh, Dave Silverman, the big controversy there was that Dave Silverman, the president of American Atheists, was originally uh, given a table. They were allowed to, to buy in to get a table. Somebody found out, and they were immediately rejected, and again, this is just a rumor, but the woman who granted him uh, this original okay to be on the show, they found her body in a dumpster, <laughs> I think. But he was uh, disinvited. Uh, shortly thereafter. So we decided to go down and table and Dave was there essentially pushing the message that Christianity and conservatism are not the same thing. There's no need for them to be joined at the hip and in fact this has done irreparable damage, irreparable damage to conservatism and Christianity and has really done a lot to mess up governance in the United States right now. And um, well, Rob, also he's trying to, to drive a wedge between Christianity and conservatism. I say, Rob, you talk about that in your book, that um, it comes down to interpretation, that there's Christ the Lamb and Christ the Lion, and you know, maybe you can say something about that. Is there one Christ, or if we head toward theocracy, who's going to decide what the rules are? Right. Well, that's sort of the Achilles heel of, of all these movements, is that what people are talking about is not a society based on the Bible. It's a society based on their interpretation of the Bible which as we know can be uh, many different things depending on how people happen to read that book. You're saying there's more than one way to interpret yeah, amazingly, the Bible. Amazingly, isn't it? Well, you talk about it in the Civil War, how there was, that was an interesting story you told there with originally the North thought that since we had, that God was punishing them and we were losing because we had a godless constitution. Right. And then later as the tide turned, it was actually God was rewarding them. Yes, right. Yeah, then people just retrofit this thing, you know, <laughs> to make the facts uh, line up with whatever their particular interpretation is. Right, and, right. and interpretations seem to be good for uh, an immediate crisis and, and not at all after that. And right. Of course, we've all seen these interpretations come and go and in direct contradiction between two people in the same room. Get two Christians together and you'll get three interpretations. Yeah, I mentioned so, that in the book too. You know, you get a couple fundamentalists in a room, within five yeah. minutes they'll be arguing about something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Well, that, that was actually a question I was going to ask later, but maybe I'll ask it now, is, is if we continue our drift toward theocracy, um, and 20 years from now some group splinters off, are they going to be welcomed and embraced by the theocracy? Um, who, who's going to be the voice at that point, you know, as we have a new splinter group from the fundamentalist religion? Well, you know, if you look at these sort of religious right organizations over the years, you do see that there is a good bit of that kind of infighting about uh, various points of doctrine, how the Bible is to be interpreted. So yeah, I mean, exactly, if these people had the reins of government, you would have to ask yourself, would it be uh, Pat Robertson's Pentecostal version of, of Christianity or a more strict fundamentalist version? Uh, uh, or, or a generic form or of Christianity. Or generic, yes. Uh, that pleases nobody. That, that's um, a question that they've never really been able to answer. I mean, they don't like the separation of church and state, but when you ask them, well, what church are you going to merge with the state exactly? Well, it's all mine, you know. It'd be right, mine. right. Yeah. How, how are they going to resolve it? Like, isn't that going to lead to the bloodbaths that they had in Europe? Isn't this exactly why we well, needed yeah, that Well, yeah, exactly why we have the principle. And of course, when people say my religion, they are overlooking the fact that the people down the street are thinking the same thing about their faith, and across the street, same thing about their faith across town. Everybody's thinking that. And if anything, we're only becoming more and more diverse on these issues. So the idea yeah. of a kind of a shared Christian consensus is uh, absolutely unworkable. But, but the, that problem is looming that you're talking about. Which religion is the Christian religion? Is it going to be Catholic? I was raised in a Southern Baptist church in West Texas. Mm -hmm. And according to what I heard, uh, Catholics are all going to hell anyway. So that may not be the best place to start with them in charge. And then too, bear in mind that the Catholic church is a foreign theocracy. And uh, you know, the United States, we may not need a foreign theocracy guiding our legislation. Well, it's interesting about, uh, if you look at these sort of attempts over the years by fundamentalist Protestant groups to sort of bring conservative Catholics into their fold to have a, a culture war united front, mm -hmm. which they sort of did a little bit over this issue of same-sex marriage, but never really took off because they have those deep doctrinal differences and they're just not the kind of thing you can paper over. Right, can you uh, maybe tell us what you mean by the religious right so that we all are talking about the same thing? I guess yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. Uh, primarily, that is a Protestant fundamentalist phenomenon uh, coming out of fundamentalist slash evangelical churches, although not, evangelical, not all evangelicals are a member of that movement. We don't want uh, people to think that, but there are some. And, and it's basically this idea that you have a, a conservative fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible that seeks to merge with state power. Uh, and I make that clear because a person can be fundamentalist and can have a very strong interpretation, a literalist interpretation of the scripture, but not believe that uh, it should be affixed to the state fixed to the power. State. Yes, right. thank you. Uh, now, there are some other elements from other faith communities that sometimes come into this movement. Ultra-conservative, ultra-orthodox Catholics, for example, you encounter them sometimes at some of these meetings. Even uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews, although in very small numbers. Mm -hmm. So there's an attempt, I guess you could say, to kind of bring together all the different arms of orthodoxy, strict, strict conservatism, uh, that type of religion, and, and push forward into the culture. Yeah. But the doctrinal differences, uh, they're, they're not easily papered over there. Right, I mean, it's, it's serious. It strikes me as so funny that, you know, the Jews were Christ killers that you hated for 2,000 years if you're in that, and now suddenly it's the Judeo Christian tradition that everybody talks about. Well, what I find really interesting is uh, if, if you look at, listen to the rhetoric coming out of some of these groups uh, anti gay, anti women, anti public education, anti evolution, all of that is shared by fundamentalist and Christianity. Judaism and Islam, yet the Christian fundamentalist would never think that he had anything in common with Islam, because that's one of their big enemies now. You know, they're, they're always fighting with each other and they uh, are very aggressive and, and attacking that particular faith, yet the rhetoric, uh, very similar in many ways. Yeah. Culture war issues, absolutely. It makes me wonder if we're the enemy of their enemy. What that means for us. <laughs> yeah, no, and if you listen to any of these, you know, fundamentalists that are, you know, get so heated and hostile to everybody, you can't tell a Christian from a Muslim, from a Jewish guy. It's all just that kind of hatred spewing forth from divine authority. Um, so, so yeah, I, mean, I think that, that's a good point that there are more similarities amongst those groups than differences. Yes, now, to be fair, there is a strain in fundamentalist Islam that is much more violent than than anything we've seen in, in modern day society and, and Christian fundamentalism. Christian fundamentalism in this country usually manis manifests itself politically, an attempt to change the culture through political means. Now that's, you know, that's legal, I, I wanna be clear on that. They're not doing anything illegal except maybe some of the attempts to 
get churches to be political. That, that is a concern of, among our laws. But a lot of what they're doing is just good old fashioned political organizing that all of us ought to be doing mm -hmm. on all points in the political spectrum to counter the extreme fundamentalist in the far right. You know, there's a, another definition we should, you should put out. Uh, you go into this over and over again in your book, what is religious freedom and what is not? What is not religious freedom? Well, I think the thing we need to keep in mind, Rick, is that religious freedom is not the right to control other people or tell them what to do. Religious freedom is an individual right. It is, I think, treasured by the American people. But it's always been interpreted in a sense of what can I as an individual do or what can I do through a band of believers, through a church or a house of worship? But even that, there are restrictions on how far they can go as far as taking away the rights of others. That's why we're seeing so many of these cultural war clashes right now. It's not enough for a fundamentalist to say, well, I don't like same-sex marriage, therefore we won't allow that in our church, and we'll excommunicate people who engage in it. And they, they have every right if, to yeah, do that. If they just did that, and, you know, we won't hire any clergy who believe in it. If they just mm -hmm. did that, nobody would have a problem. Right. But it's never enough. They want to go out into the larger culture and use the political system to force that particular version or their uh, uh, opposition to same-sex marriage uh, across the culture onto everybody. And that's where we find that uh, we're having all these conflicts right now. Well, there, there's this long, festering, and deeply ingrained sense of entitlement uh, um, at that level of religion, among the worst elements of religion, that they do indeed have that right because Jesus. Well, also, Rick, I think one of the things we have to remember is that for a long time, they did call the shots. I mean, in the book, I, I talk about how, how much control they had over the lives of average people. Uh, when I talk to younger folks, uh, I always have to remind them, you know, it was only 1965 that the Supreme Court upheld the right to use birth control. <laughs> right. Uh, before then, there were laws in many states that banned not only birth control, but even information about it. So a married couple could go to a doctor and say, we really don't want to have a lot of children. We want to limit the size of our family. What should we do? And the doctor, legally, he could not tell them. So that's pretty shocking. I mean, people today, they just think, oh, that's only so much ancient history. Well, 1965, it wasn't that long ago. Also, also uh, even, even a few years ago, they were trying to bring that type of legislation back, what doctors oh, could talk about. Of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's, well, and, and we're still seeing this fight today uh, with right. this, these new attempts to put right. curbs on birth control. Maybe we can jump into that now. We were, the last news we were going to talk about were the cases coming before the Supreme Court this Tuesday right. uh, with Hobby Lobby and Constable Woods. If you can maybe tell us about those and what the implications are if, uh, if our six Catholics and the rest of the justices, you know, find in favor yeah, of the Yeah, this is uh, very serious because um, a, a lot of people had sort of just figured that the birth control issue was settled in this country. We had the Griswold case, which I talked about in 1965, and in Eisenstadt a few years after that, which extended the right to unmarried couples. And really, uh, people sort of take that for granted today. You know, you can get these various types of birth control devices, and the pill was pretty ubiquitous. But uh, the, um, the new attack is actually coming through a religious freedom argument. That's why it's so kind of shocking to a lot of us. What these groups are saying, and these are, I should point out, secular for-profit businesses. Hobby Lobby is a chain of craft stores. Conestoga Wood makes appliances, um, um, uh, cabinets and things like that for people's houses, wood products. So these are not, you know, publishers of religious material, they're not churches. They're secular, for-profit businesses. Open to the public. They're open to the public. And so the owners, Jesus was a carpenter. <laughs> well, there is that. The owner of these businesses are saying, well, we're personally opposed to certain types of birth control, therefore we're not going to uh, allow our employees to access it to the health care plan, which is required under the Affordable Care Act. So it's really an attempt, again, if somebody is saying, I don't like birth control. Well, the old answer to that would have been, don't use it. Yeah. Well, the new answer is, I'm going to stop you from using it, too. Yeah. And that's something else. It, it's not merely enough to be able to opt out. Yes. They want more. Well, and what's really interesting is uh, th th what we're looking at at the Supreme Court this week is for-profit businesses. But there are other types of entities in society. There are religiously affiliated things like church colleges, church-related hospitals, church-related social service ministries, and they get massive amounts of taxpayer money. You know, Catholic Charities get something like 70% of its budget from the taxpayer. Catholic hospitals, you know, they get a lot of taxpayer money through Medicaid and Medicare. Catholic colleges, tons of government money coming into them. So they're, they're, but they're saying, just like these for-profit companies, we don't want to provide birth control to our employees either. And many of their employees aren't Catholic. And of course, we know from the data that has come out 
something like 98% of Catholics are using birth control right. now. Right. And I want you to extrapolate a little further. What happens when a hospital run by Jehovah's Witnesses takes over the surgery program? What happens when Scientology takes over a college? What, what kind of things are they going to decide for other people? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, you, you do have um, some serious issues here we need to look at if this becomes a general principle of law that you can opt out of a secular law because it offends your religious beliefs. Uh, the hypotheticals that you mentioned, well, Jehovah's Witnesses don't like the idea of blood transfusion, so if your boss is a Jehovah's Witness, is he going to say, I'm sorry we're not covering surgery anymore because that almost always involves a blood transfusion. If your boss is a Scientologist, is he going to say, I'm sorry, we're cutting off uh, access to antidepressants and psychiatric medicine and counseling, all types of counseling. ADHD for your children if they're on those medications. We're cutting all that off because we think the psych psychiatric profession is evil and we want nothing right. to do with it. More disturbingly is the general principle that people can simply cite religious freedom and be exempt from all manner of laws that other, are otherwise applicable to people. The fights that we saw recently in Arizona about you know, the anti-gay legislation they were considering there that popped up in dozens of other states, all of that could be reopened if the Supreme Court decides there's this broad uh, principle that, that allows you to just ignore laws you don't like because they offend your religion. Right, and, and Antonin Scalia, I don't know that I've ever quoted him in support of my life, <laughs> but you said he, he actually might be on our side in this? Well, Scalia, if you go back to 1990 when there was a case called Employment Division v. Smith, he talked about the idea of allowing people to just sort of make a law unto themselves based on their religion. I forget the exact phrase he used, but it was something like courting anarchy and would right. lead to anarchy. And as much as I disagree with Anthony and Scalia, you know, 99.5% of the time, he might have been right about that. Well, even a blind chicken gets some of the corn, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, you, you touched on a good point, though. They have this sense of entitlement because of two millennia of wealth, just unmatched wealth, of unlimited power and being in bed with government. But also, they literally had a license to kill. Well, also, think about this, too, Rick. I mean, imagine if you had... Uh, the power to determine what people could see and read, you know, books, magazines, you could censor that. You could censor movies, films, stage plays, which for many hundreds of years, they had that power. You had the power to deny women access to contraceptives, which meant you could run their lives. Because without that power, women don't have the right to make free moral agency choices. You had the power to control society in many other ways. And to see that taken away from you, piece by piece, and in many cases, especially in the case of the Catholic Church, taken away from you by the very people who were your members. <laughs> I mean, they, they turned against the clergy. Now they still believe in the church, they still go, but they don't listen to that dogmatic perspective anymore. That smarts. So any kind of opening to get that power back, they're going to exploit. Well, many people seem to see a last resurgence, a last lashing out, trying to get things uh, to establish theocracy or whatever, or some level of it, you know, these repressive laws against women and their reproductive freedom, literally trying to take away uh, constitutionally guaranteed rights away from women. And it's just appalling to me, but it's them lashing out. And the worst news for them, as I was mentioning earlier, is the millennials, the fact that most millennials are not buying this nonsense anymore and are rebelling against it. And uh, my wife and I each have daughters who are millennials, and they've never lived in a world where there was even a controversy over birth control. Right, but that's that's a threat in some ways, though, because Indeed. they, they, they don't can't know that it's a, conceive a danger. that you could go back. Uh, there's a lot of talk about younger people right now, millennials, and I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic, but I also know that in the past there have been patterns where Younger people tend to just be more progressive about these issues. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they get married, they buy a house, they start having children, and then they start grumbling about their taxes, and the next thing you know, they're flirting with a much more conservative ideology. One of the things I've noticed lately at the religious right meetings I've been attending is that the religious right groups, which are mainly concerned about social issues, are very aggressively courting groups like the Heritage Foundation, uh, various Koch brother uh, entities, that are mainly concerned about economic issues, trying to bring them into a united phalanx. Uh, they're courting Tea Party groups, getting all these, these different groups together to, to push forward, and the social issues are just kind of coming along for the ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to talk about that more. I'd like to hear who all the main players are right now that we need to be concerned with. Right now, we're just going to go to a couple of minute break and listen closely because it mentions Jamila Bay in there, and then we'll be right back. Welcome to Student News with the Secular Student Alliance. I'm Liz Liddell, the Director of Campus Organizing, and I'm here to share some of the most exciting news and events happening on high school and college campuses across the country. 
We have some exciting news to get us started off this week. The administration at Aberdeen Central High School in South Dakota has responded to our efforts to support the secular student group forming at the school. While the group was originally denied, the administration was highly responsive to our communications, recognized their error, and has confirmed that the group will be included in the Aberdeen Central High School community. We are always excited to see administrators owning up to mistakes and correcting these situations, and so we applaud the Aberdeen administrators for their response. In another piece of exciting news, we're delighted to announce that the National Secular Student Alliance is welcoming Jamila Bay as our new communications director. Jamila's extensive experience with NPR, journalistic writing, and public speaking will bring a fresh perspective to communications efforts not just for the national organization, but for secular students across the country. We're just a few days into the spring season, which is a great season for student-hosted conferences. Three major events are coming up in the next few weeks, including Skeptech 2 at the University of Minnesota, ReasonFest at the University of Kansas, and the Free Thought Festival at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. All three events, hosted by Secular Student Alliance affiliate groups, are free and open to the public. You can always learn more about Secular Students and their work on our website at secularstudents.org. This has been Student News with the Secular Student Alliance. I'm Liz Liddell, and I'll see you next time. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience and the harm they cause with a combination of facts, humour and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, or there'll be hell to pay. Welcome back. Um, touching back on the Big Bang uh, discovery with gravitational waves, Lawrence Krauss said, a rare moment in scientific history. At rare moments in scientific history, a new window on the universe opens that changes everything. Today was quite possibly such a day. Um, again, we are going to follow up on this next week. Um, and if you're interested in finding out a little bit more, Lawrence Krauss has a nice article in The New Yorker they can just pull up on the web. Uh, now, Rob, if we can get back to who are sort of the main players today that are pushing, this, pushing the religious right agenda even in the face of a more secular America? Well, the interesting thing is that some of the old players that you may be familiar with are really not so active anymore. Obviously, Jerry Falwell passed away some years ago. Pat Robertson still on television, but really, you know, in his dotage and, and clearly uh, getting ready to step down himself, I should think. Donald Wildman, who for many years ran the American Family Association, uh, had some serious health issues and has stepped down. But his son is now running that organization. So I would say that we're really looking at a, a handful of groups. One would be the uh, Family Research Council, which is a, used to be an arm of focus on the family, but it's now separate, although still closely aligned run by a gentleman named Tony Perkins. Washington-based. Washington-based, yes, in Washington, D.C. And then, of course, out in Colorado, we do still have a focus on the family. Less, somewhat less strident since James Dobson stepped away from it, but still a very large organization with a lot of money. And they were the ones behind a lot of these bills in the states that attempted to allow people to discriminate against gays by claiming a religious freedom defense. So they're still active. Uh, and an American Family Association, which I mentioned a moment ago, is a large organization with a fairly substantial budget based down in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Now, what they're doing is they're kind of reaching out to what you might call the secular economic right. A Heritage Foundation, for example, is an organization that most people don't associate with the religious right. Yet, for the past several years, at the Values Voter Summit, which is this large religious right confab takes place in D.C. every fall, there's been a substantial presence from the Heritage Foundation. So, and, and more of the rhetoric that I'm hearing coming out of the leaders of the religious right groups at these meetings is based in economic Tea Party rhetoric. Uh, there's still talk about same-sex marriage and abortion and school prayer and creationism, but 
a lot of talk about you know the tax code and uh, the estate tax and, and and just issues that you, you didn't traditionally associate with the religious right. So that's new. Well, I think you know starting back with Reagan when he got put into power, you saw this real merger of the religious right and right wing ideologues, and then the moneyed interest. The Koch brothers and their think tanks yes. have been an enormous, terrible influence. You know, in my opinion, um, Lee Fang has a book that talks about the um, it's called the machine, the resurgence of the radical right or something like that. And it goes into a lot of detail about this. And it's not as hopeful, I think, as we would like to be, maybe as you'd like to be, because that power is so ingrained that yes, even absolutely. as the young people are secular. Yeah. Well, you know, you're talking about a lot of money with these organizations. I mean, Heritage Foundation, I forget the exact size of the budget, but it's, it's enormous. They, they occupy nearly an entire city block on Capitol Hill. This is a powerful organization. We all know what the Koch brothers have. Right. You know, the formidable uh, resources. I mean, they're close to 100 billion on. worth together. And yeah, to remember, it's, their it's, father was in, you know, one of the founding members of the John Birch Society. Yeah, it's remarkable. Uh, so you're talking about a lot of resources and a lot of money here. And um, in a country where if we get, you know, 50% voter turnout, we get all excited. Mm -hmm. uh, you right. can see why sometimes we're a little bit skeptical about these claims that there's some kind of new political wave coming into the country. Maybe but it won't come to fruition unless we find a way to really activate everybody in, in that wave. Uh, historic voting patterns in this country are that you get higher turnout when there's a presidential election and then in the off years, the more committed activists vote. And I think we saw in 2010 what that can lead to and we may see it in 2014 as well. Right. Uh, just to get back to a couple of basics here, the United States is not a Christian nation and cannot be a Christian nation. Seriously? Really? <laughs> that's that's uh, pretty much my take on it. And I had a question here. Well, you're kind of biased the, as an atheist. The, the words aren't in there. Can you uh, yes, yes, elaborate uh, on that? Yes. Well, you know, you hear that all the time. It's funny yeah. that the religious right will say, well, separation of church and state's not in the Constitution. You know, they'll, they'll say, oh, it's from some letter Jefferson wrote. And, well, Christian nation is not in the Constitution either. There's no mention of Christianity. There's no mention of Jesus Christ. There's no mention of God even. In fact, mm -hmm. as you know, Rick, Article 6 bars any religious tests for public office. There are no religious qualification. Guaranteeing the right of Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and atheists to hold federal office would seem to be an odd thing for an officially Christian nation to do. Sure. Yet there it is in, the, in Article 6. Well, there are the Constitution, what it does contain, some words not in the Constitution, capitalism, you know, free market, free enterprise. Yes. Um, fair trial, I think. Fair is, trial. Um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, job creator is not in there either. Corporation, corporate person, those are not in there. But um, what is in there are two prohibitions that apply only to religion. Mm -hmm. uh, Article 6 and the fir First, First Amendment. Amendment. Yes. And uh, but a lot of people on the right, the religious right, are trying to make a living off the notion of freedom of religion. And uh, can you elaborate on that, how they've kind of stretched and abused that uh, definition? Right. I, I, I find that um, that's one of the more offensive things that we've seen over the past few years, this claim that the Constitution guarantees freedom of religion, of. but not freedom from religion. And as I, I argue in the book, even the most strident fundamentalist Christian wants freedom from religion under the right conditions. Everybody else is religious. Yeah, right. If, if a public school were teaching his child uh, liberal Christianity or Unitarianism or the Jehovah's Witness faith or Scientology or any number of, of religion, they would immediately be a hue and cry. They want to be free from that religion in a public institution. If the town council was opening its meetings with you know, Muslim prayers and everybody bowing toward Mecca, they would be screaming that they wanted to be free yes, from that would. faith. Yeah. So everybody under certain conditions wants freedom from religion. It just depends on the religion. As far as freedom of religion, we've kind of been talking about that and how important that is. But there have always historically been limits on that. And generally speaking, your right to freedom of religion will stop where someone else's rights begin. Well, freedom of is a meaningless concept without freedom from. Yes, yes. You know, and uh, the system we've, derived, we've arrived at now, and I say this a lot at tabling when I encounter somebody tough, first I'll try to get them to agree at least separation of church and state is a good thing, and point out that we've arrived at a system here. We started with a clean sheet of paper and we got, came up with a system that allows everybody to have their beliefs in religion and nobody gets to kill anybody for it. And what could be fairer than that? Right. Well, what, that's what amazes me is that the, there are so many people 
actively speaking against a system that has been so effective. Uh, if Jefferson and Madison could somehow magically come back and look at our society today, I, I, I'm sure they would be very pleased. They would realize that their experiment had worked so wonderfully well. All these different faiths, hundreds, maybe even thousands of different religions. Think about all the varieties of Christianity alone. Huge variety there. Now, I guess some people look at that and they think, as I again mentioned in the book, there are a lot of ways to go wrong because there are so many different religions. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, there are many, many traps to fall into that aren't the one true faith. And, and I just think that's a very short-sighted way of looking at it. Uh, as far as people, uh, as long as people aren't trying to tell us what to do, their ability to engage God or spirituality or whatever they want to call it in a way that's meaningful for them, I celebrate that for them. Uh, that's their right and they should have at it. But they have to realize that their personal theology cannot be the basis for secular law. Now, can, you know, a lot of secular people know about Madison and Jefferson and the contributions they made. You go out of your way in your book to talk about some of the religious people that made good you know, contributions. Also, can you tell us about Roger Williams and John Leland and what they did? Yeah, exactly. One of the things that I, we try to recapture at Americans United is that idea of a partnership between secularists and believers to, to push the idea of separation of church and state because I think that's crucial. Neither side can do it alone. People like Roger Williams, and Roger Williams was at different times in his life a Puritan minister and a Baptist and a seeker. Uh, and John Leland, who was a fiery Baptist cleric and a friend of Thomas Jefferson's, and Isaac Backus, who was another one of those fiery Baptists, they pushed so strongly for separation of church and state because they really believed that that, that was part of what uh, Roger Williams called soul liberty. You know, you, 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 the right of conscience, the right to interpret the Bible or other religious books as they're meaningful for you. States shouldn't have a, an opinion, shouldn't meddle in that. And when the state gets involved in that relationship, as Williams knew from personal experience, because remember, people were being killed at that time mm -hmm. for having the wrong religion, uh, he knew that the results of that were almost always bad. Yeah, the uh, Inquisition was last week for those guys. Yeah. It was still uh, ongoing, actually. Well, and you know about the Quakers who were hanged in Boston Common. I mean, we had these examples in our colonial era of great intolerance, of, of people not being killed, maybe being expelled from certain areas. or Like Baptists from Virginia. Yeah, imprisoned. Uh, yeah, imprisoned. The, the Jefferson wrote very powerfully about observing Baptists in prison in Virginia and wrote mm -hmm. to his friend William Bradford in Philadelphia, hot with rage about seeing these men in jail because they had done nothing but preach their doctrines on the street, which you know, the Anglican church was doing there with impunity. The official church was doing it, but didn't want any competition. Right. Now, you mentioned Americans United a couple of times. Is that a group that you and Rick and a few other atheist buddies threw together, or, or is there a little different history that people can know well, about? Americans United has always been a coalition of religious and non-religious people. It actually has roots in a religious community, but in more recent times has come to expand and include everybody, uh, because we believe, as I mentioned earlier, that the best protection for separation of church and state is to have the religious and the non-religious communities working together. Well, let's write in your name, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. And of course, uh, I'm involved with American Atheists and our charter is also Separation of Church and State, starting back with Madeleine O'Hare uh, 51 years ago. And uh, you know, we were able at CPAC, and at most tabling events we hold, even at Values Voters, we get a lot of agreement on that. Not universal, not 100% agreement, but we do get a lot of people who say, yeah, that's kind of where we're getting off the track here, the conservative side. Because separation church and state, you can get some, uh, you can get a lot of people to agree with that. We both are involved with organizations that do litigation specifically in pursuit of protecting uh, and perpetuating separation of a church and state. Right. So. It's a noble goal. Yes, absolutely. Uh, litigation is important. Of course, it has its limits. You have to kind of be looking at the courts and their composition and what's possible, what's not. And it has to be the right case. It has to be the right case. We also do a lot of lobbying in, in Congress and in the states. And also, we maintain local chapters so that people can kind of keep an eye on things and, and uh, watch out for what might be going on in their city and community. Right. Can, can you give us a few words about this book, First Freedom First? Uh, what that has to do with your organization, who these guys are? Yeah, um, Barry Lynn, who's the director of Americans United, our executive director, is a Christian minister in the United Church of Christ. He wrote that book a couple years ago, co-authored with Welton Gaddy. Welton is a Baptist minister. So you have these two ministers talking uh, very frankly and uh, very actively about why we need to maintain the separation of church and state, why it's good for faith, and why it's good for people of no faith. Uh, that's kind of the point of that book. I think it's an important one because uh, the religious right always tries to portray this as 
well, it's a bunch of atheists trying to take our Christian heritage away, and we know better than that. Right, and it's a, you know, a point that we make all the time is you know, most people in the United States are religious. Most yes. of our friends are religious. Most religious people are decent people. So we really do need to separate out somebody's, like you've done, you know, ability to be spiritual or religious. Even if we don't think that they're scientifically grounded, I'm not going to be as concerned about that if they're not setting political policy. And that's what you're separate. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because in my, in my book, I, my new book, Taking Liberties, I talk specifically about that issue, especially you said spiritual but not religious. I would urge your, your viewers to, to lighten up on those folks. They're not our enemy. They're not. If, if that was our worst problem, we'd be okay. They, they agree with us. And the religious right doesn't like them either. The religious right thinks that they're a bunch of, you know, new age people who, who, who've strayed from the one true path and they need to get back to Christ. Uh, those folks are seeking, they're looking for an answer. Uh, I have to honor their right to do that. I may not agree with the conclusion personally, but that search is something that a lot of people have gone through historically in this country. It's an important part of our history and we need to validate people's right to engage in that. It, it's hot. It's easy to forget that Barry Lynn and Welton Gaddy are both ordained ministers and active Christian Christians and Christian believers. And uh, you know, these, as you point out, these are not our enemies. We're on the same side on this very important issue. Yes. And too, you said something about most people out there, most believers, most Christians are good people trying to do the right thing, you know, for their kids and for mankind in general. And uh, they're not a problem. Our problem are what I call the worst elements of religion. And they're self-identifying. And they're the people pushing all this uh, uh, Christian nation, Christianist, yeah. dominionist uh, nonsense. Well, it's, it's fundamentalism that seeks to gain political power. That's the exactly. problem. I say in the book, religion is not the problem. It's fundamentalism that seeks a political expression. It isn't even fundamentalism because there are some strains of fundamentalism that are apolitical. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't have a problem with those folks, but the ones who say, well, I'm right, my interpretation of the Bible is right, therefore, people who think like me should run society and tell you what to do and create a godly nation, like something out of, you know, The Handmaid's Tale, uh, those are the ones that we have to fight. And, and that's like a this. book I recommend all the time. Yes. I love that book. Uh, uh, Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood. No, another track. book I'd like to yeah. throw in there um, is <clears throat> Peter Boghossian's Manual for Creating Atheist. It isn't really so much about atheism, it's about skeptical thinking. It's not trying to jam our thoughts down anybody's throat. It's trying to teach people to think critically and then come to whatever conclusions you want. So I think that, I think that fits in sort of nicely with, with your book that it's not Again, we don't have to push our agenda. We just want everybody to think freely. And I guess I'd like to ask, I know very early in your book, you mentioned that one of the rights that religion affords everybody is the right to teach your child whatever faith stuff you want. And I think that's a little controversial. It's a difficult subject. Um, you know, Richard Dawkins and Andy Thompson talk about that as almost child abuse, intellectual abuse. What, what are your feelings on that? And do you have any thoughts about how we get kids to think critically without stepping on parents' rights? Right. I, I might agree a little bit with, a little, disagree a little bit with Dawkins on that, because I think that uh, parental rights are very important in this regard. Now, they don't extend anything that's like abuse. You know, occasionally you hear people talking about, uh, well, the Bible says, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child, so I'm going to beat my children. Uh, there are limits. You can, uh, the state can step in, the state can require medical treatment for children who are being neglected, all that sort of thing. But having said all that, I think the right to pass along your religious or your philosophical views to your children is a very important one. It's one that humanist and atheist want, and I think that in order to uh, have it protected for them, it must be protected for believers as well. So uh, taking your children to church or putting them in Sunday school, attempting to raise them up, putting them even in a religious uh, educational environment without any taxpayer support for it. Uh, that's all, I think, part of this larger question of people having the right to pass those views along. Now, you ask a question about how do you raise children in a more, uh, what was the phrase you used? Like if you teach them to think critically think at an early critically. age <laughs> and then let them decide as they get to the you know, age of reason what they think about various religions. Here's an interesting spin on that. Uh, despite what parents try to do sometimes, things can just go off in other directions. I'm sure both of you know a lot of ex-fundamentalists, and they'll t sometimes I'll run into these people at meetings, and they'll talk about, well, my parents were very strict, and they sent me to this kind of a school, and they, you know, made me go to church three times a week, and all this sort of thing. But I got a hold of something, or a book, or a friend challenged me, or I started to think differently. That happened to me. I was raised in a very conservative Catholic household, and I started to question that. So it happens to lots of us. So no matter how hard you try. You never can guarantee what, what the outcome will be. Well, even, I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, I agree with a lot of that. But 
we still have the vast majority of Americans believe in God and don't believe in evolution. And I think if you had everybody educated in a secular, critical thinking yes. mindset, the statistics would be reversed. There's a lot of reasons, you know, like you know, neurochemically, why people believe in God. But if you didn't get that pounded into you from your two to seven years old, I don't think most people would necessarily gravitate toward uh, monotheistic. Religion. One thing I'd like to see us do, and I think this would be something that would be helpful across the board, would be more of an emphasis on critical thinking generally in our in our public education system. And I think that would affect not just questions of religion, but just across the board. Sure. Uh, one of the things that kind of discourages me in this country is how quickly people will reach for a fantastic pseudo-scientific explanation for an event when there are perfectly reasonable uh, explanations grounded in science. For example, this airliner that's disappeared that a lot of people are talking about. Yeah, I suppose it could have been sucked into a black hole and sent into a fourth dimension that we don't know exists yet, uh, but more likely it crashed in the ocean somewhere. Uh, Occam's razor, as many of you are familiar with, is a very uh, standard rule that says basically don't reach for fantastic explanations when there are simpler ones available. Uh, that would help people in a lot of ways. I think it would help people if we educated them in that regard, not fall to hucksters and people uh, selling fraudulent medical cures, uh, people uh, trying to rip them off in various ways. So it would be useful across the board. Now there's been resistance to it, I think, for various reasons, but uh, I think it would be a much more rational society across the board if we help people understand that they shouldn't always look for fantastic explanations when they're confronted with something they don't understand. Right. And atheists too, we start our shows challenging atheists who believe in stuff without support to think about it more deeply. It's not just a religious issue. We know atheism is no guarantee against falling for strange ideas. That's Bill Maher, sure. who a lot of people admire, mm -hmm. believes that the flu shot will give you Alzheimer's disease and yeah. has advocated various uh, anti-medical ideas, I think, that are quite dangerous. And I've run into other non-believers over the years who have rather unusual ideas about uh, especially medicine. Absolutely. Medical yeah. quackery uh, is very widespread in this society. In fact, I just read something online a few days ago about something like one in five Americans believes in some facet of medical quackery. Uh, very high percentages there. And it's dangerous because as we've seen recently with the anti-vaccination movement, whooping cough is, uh, is, is uh, coming back, measles outbreaks. Polio. Polio, I mean, things India. that we thought we had put down a long time ago, coming up again. And not, believe me, a lot of those people who are resisting that and, and this are points, coming from a secular progressive right. mindset. This points to the, the danger of people's opinions are not uh, without some effect in this, this unholy attack on science and on education yes. and on educators is having an effect. It, it is fertile ground for this anti-vax type thinking and other nonsense. Yeah, I think you're right about that, Rick, and I think that there is a um, sort of a continuous thread running through a lot of that type of stuff. Uh, so they're, they're doing real harm by spreading ignorance. Well, what you find, especially with creationism, which is something I've looked at over the years, wishful thinking has replaced science. Whenever that happens in any facet of our understanding, whether it's medicine or another area of science, uh, we see the results. Eventually science, real science, has a way of just asserting itself. People can say, for example, well, I, I don't believe in global warming, but the temperature will continue to go up. As I often say sometimes when I'm speaking to people, uh, yeah, fine, you're, you're free not to believe in science, you're free not to believe in evolution, but it's going to march on anyway. Indeed, <laughs> when we're pumping 80 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every day, you know, it, when somebody said on TV this week, oh, that's hilarious, but it's true. When you argue with math, you're going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Christopher Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens had his uh, God poisons everything or religion poisons everything. Mm -hmm. I guess I would throw out there that money poisons a lot of stuff too. Um, you see it with the Koch brothers you talked about. We've got these, the biggest polluters have propaganda machines and they spend millions of dollars. Miss, and you talk about it in your book too. It's not just that people don't get it. There's a lot of mis purposeful misinformation out there by people that stand to make a lot of profit. Um, and then the same thing with the medical industry. Uh, ben Goldacre has a great book that talks about how we only publish the positive studies. So Pfizer is happy to put out five studies showing why it works, but the five that showed that it didn't work so well disappear. Um, and that leads to the opening for people that believe in quackery and want to promote it, you know, to say that, you know, the, that the medicine isn't perfect by any means because money is sort of poisoning it, but then just opens the door for outright fraud and charlatans. You know, an interesting sort of facet of that to bring kind of things back around to religion is that when there are cases of that, 
really blatant cases of quackery. Sometimes the government will act. Uh, Kevin Trudeau recently, you might have read about that, uh, was sent to, sentenced to federal prison for some of the stuff he was putting out that was very dangerous, bad dieting advice. But religious people who engage in similar types of faith healing or other types of quackery, as James Randi noted in his famous book, The Faith Healers, they're often given a pass because they're claiming it's religion. Right. So they're engaging in activities that are very dangerous in many cases, especially for young people and children. And yet um, they're not seriously being looked at by the government. And that takes us to the question of all these sort of exemptions and preferential treatment that people get simply by claiming religion. Uh, there, there's the automatic built-in yes. belief that, they're, that you can't really fight them over it or it, it's, it's rude to... Uh, Yes. challenge them on it. I don't subscribe to that, but I know a lot of people do. Oh yeah, absolutely. And now what we're seeing is this attempt to push the boundaries of religious freedom even more so that they will encompass things like discrimination or uh, the right to say, well, uh, you know, my business is Christian, therefore you people can go elsewhere. There's a different hotel for you. There's a restaurant across town that serves your type. When have we heard that before? Right. And, you know, I think the society, I guess, is advanced enough that people can't just come out and say, I hate black people, I hate gay people. But if you couch it in religious terms, you can do the exact same thing. And like you said, you get a total you know, here's what, And here's what they're really scared about. They're very frightened, the fundamentalist mindset, I think, because they know that they're on the losing end of this. The culture has, it's remarkable, I think, this wave that's building right now. Uh, if someone had told me even like 15 years ago that we would have same-sex marriage in this country in many states, I think I would have probably scoffed at that. I just didn't think society was ready for it. But it's happened very quickly, and it continues to happen. More court decisions, you're reading about them you know, pretty regularly where they're, where they're basically allowing this to occur in different states. The fundamentalists know that they're losing on this, just like I think the segregationists must have known that they were losing. And even though they said they were going to stand there in the schoolhouse doors forever, they knew the tide was turning. We're going to come to the point where that type of open bigotry against LGBT people is just not socially acceptable. And that's what's really scaring the Catholic bishops and the fundamentalist Protestants. It's not that the law is going to make them do anything, that the state's going to make them do anything, because the state's not going to make their church perform same-sex services. But the culture is going to come to a point where it says, that's bigotry and we don't care for it. And that's what they're really worried about. But they can't stop that. No, it'll be social correctness uh, outweighing uh, religious correctness. The government doesn't need to come in and make anybody do anything. The culture is going to take care of these things. No, you can't make a person not be a bigot. I mean, they are. They, there's a manual of bigotry they seem to, uh, which is their central book. But, um, you know, like I say, most people are pretty decent people. But... Uh, Plenty of good examples of not. Speaking uh, of not good people, I want to jump to, I think it was you and Paul was you and Larry, um, that interviewed Chris Rhoda a few weeks yeah. ago yeah. Um, and spoke about David Barden. <laughs> and I'd like you to maybe go into what is historical creationism and remind viewers who he is and a few sure. words. Well, first I have, I have to tip my hat to Chris Rhoda because she's done excellent work on David Barton. Uh, the research, just so penetrating and so deep, uh, she really has just... Um, dug up a lot of stuff on him that I certainly was not aware of and other, other people who have looked at this. But David Barton is this Texas individual who passes himself off as an historian, which really bothers me because I'm a guy who likes to read history, but that doesn't make me a historian. Mm -hmm. You have to have appropriate degrees to be a historian. You have to study it. He didn't study it. Uh, he has a... But, but also, you can't have the kind of agenda he's no, got. No, he's got an agenda. Real historians have, uh, don't have a bias here. I mean, they're, they're, they'll go where the research leads them, just as a scientist feels the same way. So Barton has made a living putting out this phony Christian nation stuff. And he's been doing it for a long time. He came on my radar screen in 1993. So we're talking about guys who've been around for quite yeah. a while. Uh, it's a very sophisticated operation. It raises a lot of money. He gives a lot of presentations in fundamentalist churches. He puts out a lot of books. He puts out a lot of DVDs. He appears on cable access programs. He's all over the place. But it's just all you know, built on this really thin tissue of lies. Yeah. And Chris and others have done a really good job debunking it. But it just... It's like whack-a-mole, you know, it keeps popping up. <laughs> you, were, you were talking too early about uh, Colorado Springs and uh, focus on the family down there. And they were neck deep in the troubles at the Air Force Academy. They're yes. proselyt pro proselytizing? Yes. Uh, proselytizing at the Academy, you know. And uh, uh, Chris Rhoda and the, and the organizations uh, MAAF and the other one, I forget. Military Religious Freedom yeah, Foundation. Yeah. Mikey Weinstein blew a whistle yeah, on Mikey that. Yeah, Mikey Weinstein. We worked with him. Very and they important. basically shut that down. They yes. got it uh, 
And it, it, there continued to be problems, but I have to say a lot of progress was made on that yes. in a fairly short period of time because Mikey and Americans United and other groups just hit that hard. I mean, that's a taxpayer-funded, government-run service academy, and they were, they were basically operating it like it was uh, you know, a Christian yeah. fundamentalist playground. Absolutely, an extended ministry, which is yeah. what they like to do with local public schools. If the biggest church around seems to think it's an extended ministry, uh, mission ground yeah. for them. It's important, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of kind of looking a little deeper at some of these questions. It's important to remember why they feel that way sometimes. Remember, these are people who believe in the Great Commission, which is the idea of spreading their gospel as far and wide as possible. Now, with their own money, on their own initiative, I have no problem with that. But they continue to try to work it into public institutions like public schools and universities because they know there's a large body of so-called so unsaved people there. Right. So if you, you always have to be looking out for that. Uh, if you have children in the public school system uh, because there are people who are going to try to use that school system to promote their views because that there's just a huge number, like 90% of our children are attending the schools. They wanna, it's a mission field to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think the whole voucher system, again, money plays into this, but you maybe you can say a little bit more about the voucher system, why the, you know, George Bush was so gun-ho for that. Is he, uh, well, That's another interesting nexus of the religious right and the secular right coming together to work together to, you know, to push for this idea. Some of these individuals are really interested in uh, basically shutting down the public school system in this country. They don't like teachers' unions. They don't like the fact that it's government-run. They have a philosophical bias against anything public. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to privatize the schools. The religious right, of course, wants to come in and have us all, all of our kids go to religious school. So definitely something we need to keep an eye on. We've got less than a minute. You talk in here, too, about special rules for the religious, 501c3s. you got 45 seconds. Yeah, they get a lot of uh, special advantages in the tax code. So I think all these claims... They, they that don't even have to apply. They're no, automatically awarded. By dint of their existence, they are tax-exempt if you're a house of worship. So all this claim about and persecution... And not in the Constitution. Uh, no, there's nothing about tax exemption in the Constitution. They're not required to fill out any forms. They're not required to say how much money they're spending. They have no reason to complain. Yeah, exactly. There's no persecution. There's special treatment. Yeah, very special treatment. Can I sneak in 20 seconds on George Washington said something to the Toro Synagogue of Rhode Island way back when, just because conservatives still say that we're a Christian nation. What was Washington's view on protecting Jewish rights? Well, he basically we said that uh, those rights would be protected in this country, that they didn't specifically say it wasn't a Christian nation. We made it clear in the language that all religions would be respected in this country. All right, yep. Well, he was a bit of a mixed bag, but uh, owning <laughs> slaves and all, but you know, you gotta, you gotta like that stuff. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We're just about My out pleasure. of time here. Boston, his new book is uh, Taking, Taking Liberties. Liberties. It's a great read. Right. So, and you also have, he's got a few other books too to look and just get a better history of the religious right because he doesn't have a passing acquaintance. He's been immersed in this stuff. So, for, Rob, uh, thanks for decades. joining thank you, us gentlemen. in the studio again. Uh, All right, next week, Rick and Larry Mendoza are going to be talking more about that discovery having to do with the Big Bang. Physics and creationism next week. So, join us then.